Hello everyone, this is Bart Coppens and today I'm going to show you my nuts. There you go! These nuts! What were you thinking you pervert? These are the nuts I'm going to show you today, silly pervert. This is Bart Coppens and today I am going to show you a traditional Dutch snack from my country, the Netherlands. Not many people know much about the Netherlands and the things that we eat. But there's actually a lot of interesting stuff you can only eat in the Netherlands. And this is one of them. The package reads Kruidnoten. And if I had to translate Kruidnoten, it translates to spice nuts. The word Kruid means weed or spices. And the word noten means nuts. Now this name makes absolutely no sense because they are not nuts at all. Now these things may look silly but they have been eaten in the Netherlands since the 16th freaking century, right? So this silly little snack has like four centuries of history behind it. And they are called spice nuts or kruidnoten, but really they are spiced cookies. And I will show you by breaking one, it is in no way a nut. They are really tiny cookies with a selection of spices. These tiny bite-sized cookies with spices in them are actually incredibly popular in the Netherlands. They are especially traditionally eaten around the months of November and December. Around the festivities of Christmas, but also the festivities of Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas is basically the Dutch version of Santa Claus. It even sounds similar. Sinterklaas, Santa Claus, Sinterklaas, Santa Claus. You hear the similarity and it's basically the same. Sinterklaas is basically like this noble old guy who comes to the Netherlands and gives presents to children. And around this time of the year we eat a lot of this stuff. I don't know how many people who are watching my channel actually care about history. But if you know history and if you know the history of the Netherlands then you know that spices were a very big deal. Around the 17th century, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a history buff, but around the 17th century the Netherlands more or less controlled the spice trade. And they brought many new spices to the Netherlands such as coffee, tea, pepper, um, but also other stuff like cinnamon, cardamom. And these spices when introduced to the market were extremely expensive in fact. And it's for that reason that spices were very popular among rich people and considered delicacies. And that's how people came up with spiced cookies. It was basically an exquisite snack for rich people who could afford to eat spices. Now over time spices have become very cheap and ingredients like cinnamon and pepper are now really cheap at the supermarket. But these cookies are still a relic of the past and they taste pretty great. Let me read to you what is used to make these cookies. So they are baked with cinnamon. There are cinnamon in them cloves, nutmeg, cardamom, ginger, and brown sugar and salt. So that's a lot of spices. Cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, cardamom, and ginger. That's pretty, yeah, that, and that really causes a really unique peppery and spicy flavor of these cookies. Now, nowadays in the Netherlands you can f find many varieties of these kruidnoten or spiced cookies. There's ones covered in chocolate, there's chocolate chip variants, there's, uh, I don't know, all kinds of fancy variants. But those are not really the traditional ones, those are new modern adaptations. This is actually the plain and traditional variety of kruidnoten or spiced Dutch cookies. And it summarizes our history with the spice trade, 
Very much. It's interesting how in the Netherlands you have these really small inconspicuous snacks. But if you look into their history it's actually a quite rich and old tradition. Now I'm not a nationalist, I'm not that much into Dutch culture. But I'm telling you this today anyways. So let's try one. <coughs> so these mini cookies are really crunchy. And the flavor is really unique. I, um, there's, there's not many things that taste like these cookies. To be honest. Mm. Let me try to describe the flavor for you. Let me get you a handful. The texture is really interesting. They are almost sand-like and very dry. They are very hard to bite into and crunchy. But in your mouth they actually melt pretty fast. So it's like really hard and crunchy at first. But then it becomes sandy and eventually really soft. I would describe the flavor as sweet and spicy. I can taste the salt. They are very salty cookies. I can really taste the cinnamon. The cinnamon also has a spicy flavor to it. And so has the nutmeg. And it's this combination of spices and salt that makes it for an, um, an interesting snack to experience, to be honest. Now, I've mentioned that they are often made from cinnamon, cardamom, ginger um, and other ingredients. But what they also add sometimes is white pepper. Yeah, that's right, the kind of white pepper that we use um, like in soups or on meat. It basically goes with anything. That kind of white pepper we also put in these cow notes sometimes. But also coriander and anise seed sometimes. So it really depends on what brand you have. But generally you can expect an almost peppery and spicy sweet flavor. If you are a foreigner and you want to experience Dutch food, try these if you like spicy and sweet uh, snacks, I suppose. Or cookies in general. They are quite addictive and they make you thirsty as well. I imagine these things contain a lot of salt. I noticed that I'm having a dry mouth. After this video I'm probably gonna have to drink a lot of water. I've already told you that in the Netherlands we basically have the watered down version of Santa Claus and his name is Sinterklaas. He also has helpers called Black Pete or Zwarte Piet. Now recently there was a bit of controversy that uh, Black Pete are supposed to represent slaves and that is racist. I'm kind of in the middle. I don't think it is a racist tradition because the story goes that Black Pete isn't actually a black person. He crawls to this chimney and when he gets covered with soot he becomes black. Then again, I think if it's really that offensive to people, uh, I don't think that, I don't know, trying to accommodate people's feelings is that bad of a thing, you know? I'm not one of those people who makes a huge, huge, uh, who throws a huge tantrum over a party, a festivity that's basically targeted at children. In my opinion, it's both the people who are screaming that, oh, it's racist, it's racist. But also the people who are, I don't know, on the other side of the spectrum and saying, well, I don't care if you're offended, you're a snowflake and uh, Black Pete has to remain black. I think both of these people are silly. They're both making a big deal over what's in, in my opinion, not really a big deal. But I digress. I will refrain from making this video too political. We can save that uh, debate for another video in the future, maybe, if you're interested in hearing my opinion. But what's interesting is that these helpers of Santa Claus called Black Pete. What they do is they will grab a handful of these cookies and they will throw it around like this. I'll do it one more time because I don't want to waste food but 
And that's actually what happens. And the children go around and try to grab the candies before they fall to the floor. Or in some cases eat them off the floor, which is kind of gross in my opinion, but hey. That's what happens. Yes, it's true, believe it or not, but it's a tradition to throw these candies at people. Often children will attempt to grab them from the air, or in horrible cases eat them from the ground, something which I think is disgusting, but hey, it's a tradition. Basically you're literally scattering the candy all around, while people are grabbing for it like rabbit hungry dogs. Now Dutch Kruidnoten or Spice Cookies, I don't know why we call them nuts, it's stupid, they are cookies not nuts. Nowadays they come in a million varieties. And one variety that I think is really tasty is the chocolate coated ones. So let's give these a try. Put them in here. And as you can see these are the Dutch Spice Cookies, the Kruidnoten. But each of them is covered in a layer of chocolate. And in my opinion, this is one of the best varieties we have. I, I love eating these. However, if you really care about traditional and authentic, then I don't recommend eating these. These are a modern adaptation. Traditionally, these uh, Kruidnoten are traditionally not covered with anything like chocolate. The version I showed you before is actually the original uh, traditional version. This is just modern stuff, but companies like to reinvent traditional recipes, I suppose. And this is a good result. Now, in my opinion, the um, traditional and plain version of Kruidnoten, they are okay. They are not um, like my favorite thing to eat. Usually, uh, when I go to the supermarket, I never buy them, to be honest. They are kind of enjoyable though, they are spicy, they are salty, they are crunchy. But usually I prefer to eat other snacks. These chocolate coated varieties, however, are really godly in my opinion. These are really, really good. The ones with chocolate on it. What's really cool is they are coated in a variety of chocolate, like dark, milk and white chocolate. And the combination of the coating with the spicy cookie is really good. Like it's, it's really really good. These things, I can eat a million of them. You know? It's like the soft and milky um, taste that the chocolate provides and then the crunchy and spicy combination with the cookie. It's really incredible. If any Americans or Asians or foreigners are watching this and you want to order food from the Netherlands that nobody eats and you want to be a hipster to your friends and say haha well I've eaten exclusive food from the Netherlands that nobody knows about. Try these to impress your friends. I guarantee they'll like it, and if they don't, they will then have just a shitty taste, man. These are so good. If I had to give them a rating, this is like a 9 out of 10, man. These things are really nice. When I was at the supermarket, I saw something new. A chocolate chip variety. I thought it was interesting. Uh, what? Okay, these are really weird. This is a chocolate chip variety. Underside seems to be coated in chocolate too, and it has kind of like these chocolate flakes inside of them. Let's give it a try. Once again, the varieties with chocolate are not a really original traditional recipes, okay, it's a modern adaptation. And the reason I'm repeating this info, it sounds silly, but sometimes people in the Netherlands actually become upset when you buy like Kruidnoten. Uh, who have chocolate in them and if you promote them on social media sometimes you'll get Dutch people who are complaining like oh Bart these are not the originals uh, not the original Kruidnoten you're just posting an American adaptation and they'll, they'll be all passive aggressive like oh Bart 
you're not promoting the real thing, you know, it's not a real original version. And I kind of understand. It's kind of like when Italians um, see someone promoting American pizza as uh, Italian pizza. I kind of see how it hurts them. Dutch people have the same sometimes when you promote a Dutch snack. And it isn't actually the traditional version, but an adaptation of it. And you'll get people in the comments, Bart, originally these cookies are not made with chocolate. Wah, wah. So that's the disclaimer. That being said, very non-Dutch, okay, very modern adaptation of the uh, Kruidnoten with chocolate chip in them. Uh, oops, that was very impolite. Interesting. These, they added a lot of spices to these. These are way spicier than the ones I had before. Hmm. To be honest, the taste is interesting. But I don't really like these very much for some reason. The taste of chocolate is very faint, but the spice blend they use is also different. It's way more sharp and spicy. And the dough seems to be softer in this version. A little bit. The size also appears to be bigger than the regular average crowd note. It's, in it's interesting, it's not bad, but um, the <clears throat> these are probably the least enjoyable version I tried today. Sorry Albert Heijn, not to insult your brand, but um, the chocolate coated ones that I showed you before, those are really excellent, they are really amazing. But these chocolate chip ones, to me they are not that great. I think even the original ones that I uh, tasted at the beginning of this video taste better than this weird variety. All right, people, it's time for the Day of Judgment. Bolletje Kruinoten, the original ones. I would say six and a half out of, out of ten. It's just the original thing. There's not much you can change about the original thing, to be honest. But uh, yeah, if you buy these, you pretty much expect to have the real thing. Bolletje. Mixed chocolate uh, spice nuts, gemengde chocolade krautnoten. Damn, these are really good. The taste is incredible, it's hard to describe, but I would say 9 out of 10 to be honest. I love these. So, this is the recommendation of Bart Coppens. Try these mixed spiced cookies. Last but not least, the Albert Heijn chocolate chip variety. Uh, I would say a 5 out of 10. I'm sorry Albert Heijn, but I did not really enjoy these. They're even worse than the original version. So, if you add chocolate to something and it comes out worse than it originally tasted without chocolate, you're doing something wrong, man. Why am I making this video? It makes absolutely no sense. I am Bart Coppens. I'm an entomologist, um, I'm a YouTuber, I'm a blogger, I'm a butterfly and moth breeder. But what I am not is a food critic. My channel is usually about biology, about nature, stuff like that. So a video about me eating Dutch food from my country seems terribly out of place. Well, let me explain to you why. It's, on my channel we have kind of a tradition. You see, I am a demonetized content creator. What this means is that um, when I upload a video on YouTube and it gets a lot of attention, and it gets a lot of views, and it gets a lot of subscribers, I don't benefit from it. YouTube is not paying me. YouTube told me that my content is not worth monetizing. So my channel is completely and permanently demonetized. That's a huge, huge problem. It basically gives me a huge disadvantage as a YouTuber 
Um, it's very hard for me to get compensated for all the hard work and free time I put in my videos. So one day I had a smart idea and I was like, why not do crowdfunding? <coughs> why not beg for donations? It was embarrassing to make that choice, because for some reason begging always feels a little bit humiliating to me. That's my only option. I don't have big companies sponsoring me. It's me doing all of this by myself, putting so many hours of my life into it. And um, basically by asking people for tips and donations is how I fund my channel and how I can make documentaries and life cycles, which is time consuming. And I spent hundreds of dollars in budget for the videos that I make. And one day I was thinking, what can I offer in return? When people donate to my channel, what can I give them back? Some kind of quality, some kind of value or entertainment. And as a joke, I said, every $55 we raise on the crowdfunding website named Ko-Fi, I will show you a traditional Dutch snack from my country. And so I did when we raised the $55 tips goal. And people liked it. And then we had the next episode, and the next episode, and now I think we already have eight episodes of this series, because people uh, keep tipping me, and every time we raise $55 on the website Ko-Fi, I will present you a Dutch snack from my country, as promised. And that's what we are doing today. On the crowdfunding website Ko-Fi, we recently achieved the $55 goal, and uh, because of that, as promised, I deliver a new video of a snack of my country. And each time we hit the goal, I will produce a new episode of this series. Now, of course, the point of tipping me is so that you support me and my content and my channel. But some people actually seem to like this series a lot. I've actually started getting requests for particular items and foods to show. I'm surprised, to be honest. I think it's because not many people know a lot about my country, the Netherlands, and are curious about our traditions and culture. And I realized there's not a lot of Dutch YouTubers doing this. So I actually have a, I have a big fan base for the insect. But I also noticed I have a small fan base for, for this series for some reason. And sometimes people send me exclusively donations so just so I produce the next episode. And for that I thank you, because of that my content can continue in the future and we raise more awareness for nature. We can do more education about biology, um, the life history of insects, which are very important animals. And on top of that, show you tasty food. Traditionally, I always review the comments that people made. When you can leave a tip on my Ko-Fi website page, you can um, usually leave a little comment or a question that I will answer. First one is from Aaron. Aaron tipped me, uh, let me see, $35. That's a very generous donation, Aaron. Thank you very much for the $35. It will go into my budget to film um, insects and produce cool content for you guys. And Aaron tells us, it's been a while, so I figured it's time for a new episode. It feels like a year since the last episode. Yeah, I agree, the last episode was a long time ago. It was funny because around uh, in spring, I remember, for some reason, like uh, <clears throat> three or four people got together and tipped me a lot and then we had like five episodes in one month that was crazy so um it makes sense for me that it's it's not going to continue at that pace usually these episodes happen once every few months but um i think it's because we had many episodes in a short time this spring that it feels like it's been a long time but anyway thank you maybe it has been a long time but uh, you are the one who made a new episode happen Thank you for your $35 donation, it's very much appreciated. People like you are the lifeblood of my channel. So the next tip is from somebody called Trixalized. And the message reads, yeah! In response to that I say, yeah! 
Thank you for your uh, $3 tip. I appreciate it. The next uh, tipper is anonymous. And it reads, someone bought you a coffee. Someone paid $6. Thank you, anonymous person, for the $6. I do not know who you are or what your name is. But it seems that you preferred it to be that way since you chose to be an anonymous tipper. Thank you, anonymous person who sent me $6. The next tip is from somebody called Jeff Knight. Thank you, Jeff, for tipping me $5 in order to meet the tips goal to make this episode. Hold on, we are not finished yet. We have a few more tips. So the next tip is by somebody called Tim Mothy. Hey Bart, I love your videos. Since I get to ask you a question, yes you do, feel free to include questions with your tip. What do you think is the purpose of life? What do I think is the purpose of life? You're putting me on the spot, man. Here's my opinion. I think it's um, stupid to think in terms of purpose. Personally, I think it's stupid to think in terms of purpose. I think the whole concept of purpose is a very human concept. The thing about our brains is that our brains are tools of survival. Inside our beautiful head is an amazing biological machine that loves to make sense of its surroundings. So when we see something like a deer, we will rationalize that its purpose is to eat it for meat. When we see a tool, an object, when we see fire, we will try to find applications for it that relate back to us. And we will rationalize, well, the purpose of fire is to cook your food or keep yourself warm. That is the purpose of fire. But does that mean that those things exist for the sole reason of filling that certain purpose? Or is it just you who happen to assign a certain value to something that already happened to exist? You see, in my opinion, nothing exists with a purpose. I think that's a very silly idea. It... Um, it accepts the notion that everything around us was somehow designed and that everything needs a justification just to exist, you know? People will see an object, they will see an animal or a plant and they'll question what is the purpose of its existence? That's stupid! You know, things don't need a justification to exist. That's a very human-centric worldview. If you look at the universe and how big the universe is, and how complex it is and how difficult to understand, and you look at something that is so much bigger than us, and you think, wow, what is its purpose, you know? That's kind of an egotistical thought, because you think, well, somehow this is created for us, you know? Purpose is, is a human... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a human quantification of a value or a justification for something to exist. And it makes no sense. I don't think there is any purpose to life. I think it's stupid to think there is a purpose to life, in fact. It almost uh, promotes the idea that we are created for a reason. That's absolute nonsense. I think that we as humans must accept the fact that the universe and all of the things in it can exist without a justification. I think things can exist without any reason. Life is a combination of probability, not random probability, but a directed combination of tiny probabilities adding up, sending us into 
well, basically a cycle of self-propagation and selection. Life was not made with a single purpose. That's a silly idea. See, the purpose of this smartphone is to call my friends and to talk with my friends and check my video analytics on YouTube. The purpose of this camera is to film myself right now. The purpose of this plant pot is to grow plants in it. But the thing is that all the things I just showed you are tools and components produced by humans with a specific purpose. That's because in our minds all the things that we do are directed at self-preservation. So all the actions of a human and its environment and all the things in its environment that it uses will be given a sense of purpose by our brain. But the problem is we tend to extend this type of thinking to everything around us, you know, to our environment. And we start to imagine that everything around us is a tool or that everything around us is created with a purpose. That's simply not true. We should stop having this very human-centric point of view and see the, uh, the universe as like an instrument of creation. It's not. Accept the fact that things can in fact exist without a purpose. Life has no purpose. Life is what you make of it. And I know there's religious people who are going to disagree and say, well, in the Bible, in the holy book, it says that God designed life to have this specific purpose. But if you look at the day-to-day -day life of humans, you'll realize that they are lying to themselves. Even they subconsciously know that life has no purpose. For example, you will go to the supermarket today in order to have food on the shelf for tomorrow, right? You're going to the supermarket for the purpose of having something to eat tomorrow. When you go to work, when you make money, you are working for the purpose of perhaps receiving your paycheck next month, right? So you go to the supermarket to eat tomorrow and you go to work so you can pay your food next week. Maybe you're at college too, you're studying. Your degree will take several years to achieve, right? So you're studying at college so um, for the purpose of graduating maybe in three or four years time while you are working for the purpose of affording your food next week while you're doing groceries for the purpose of receiving your food tomorrow right but this, the longer you stretch this time frame the less purpose you will find maybe people will invest in their future so that their grandchildren and their grand-grandchildren may benefit from the wealth that the family has accumulated. So you, look, you say people are doing things for the purpose of benefiting them and others, maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100 years. But when you grab this time frame and you stretch it, think about centuries, think about millions of years. Is anybody doing anything today to impact what is going to happen in millions of years from today? No. You study today to benefit from it in a few years time. You invest today so your investment will pay itself back like three or four years down the line. You go to the grocery stores today so you can eat next week. But you don't do any actions, you don't perform any investments in things that will affect you or humanity after the point after you die, right? Because that makes no sense. But if life, if life had a greater purpose, that would make perfect sense, right? I mean, nobody, no human on this planet is living their life in a way that reflects the idea of life having a, a greater overarching purpose. That's no, simply not true. Nobody is really investing much effort and time in things that will affect them beyond the grave. When you die, it's over. 
So most of the things we call purpose, most of our directed actions that have a specific purpose, are specific to us and our families and maybe our society. But we don't really care what happens millions of years from now, even if humanity survives that long, probably not. Nobody is investing today in a better future for people thousands of years down the line. We are living from day to day. And we do think about the later moments in our life, especially when we are young and we have to invest in our future. But clearly, humanity is not behaving in a way that shows an understanding of a greater purpose. And that's because there isn't any purpose, you know? People will say, well, life was created as a test by God, you know? Life was created to have a special purpose by God. But if that was true, why is it that nobody really cares about the, the culmination of time of a, long, of a long time frame, you know? If life really had a greater purpose and it was all made for one big, cool destiny, uh, to have a destiny, why does nobody really care what happens after the moment they die, right? Because the, uh, the purpose would still be there, even if your life ends. That's because everything we call purpose is simply self-preservation. People don't care if in million a year, millions of years the sun is going to burn out and the earth will literally get scorched when the sun explodes and there will be no life left on earth. Do we care about that? Are people losing sleep today? That, oh my God, in a million years, humanity is going extinct. No, most people don't care because it's not going to affect their lifetime right now. And we know that what's going to happen in a million years is not going to affect us today. So we really don't care. We don't see it as a threat. And that's an indicator that there is no overarching, uh, overarching purpose. No, no, no larger structure that encompasses our individual lives because we don't live our lives to reflect that. We live our lives in a very um, temp contemporary way, you know. We attempt to preserve ourselves, we attempt to procreate. But even people who give a spiritual meaning to purpose, they are lying to themselves. And to be honest, purpose is what you make of something, right? I can take this leaf. And I can give it purpose by like, uh, oh, well, maybe this is a really rare plant. And uh, so it's really expensive. And I will make it a status symbol to wear this, you know, like a crown. Maybe only royalty are able to wear this rare plant on their head. And then we'll say, well, that's the purpose of this plant, you know. It's the purpose of gold and jewels to be rare and precious and use them as status symbols. But it's a subjective value that I assign to it. The purpose of a fish is not to get eaten. Yeah, we eat fish. Humans fish a lot and we eat fish. But it doesn't mean that that fish is there just for you to take advantage of. It was already there. And if you die and if we go extinct, that fish is still going to be here on Earth. It was not created for us. The environment is not created for us. The universe is not created for us. It's not created with a purpose. It just exists irregardless of us and our actions. And to uh, support my point of view, I will use a quote from a philosopher called Arthur Schopenhauer. And one time he was talking about astrology. And he said, astrology furnishes a splendid proof of the contemptible subjectivity of man in consequence whereof they refer everything to themselves and from every idea at once to go straight back to themselves. Astrology refers to the course of celestial bodies, to the miserable ego. It also establishes a connection between the comets in heaven and the squabbles and rascalities on earth. Now in less older English for the people who do not understand what this means, he was talking about astrology and how people look at the stars and they make like these horoscopes, right? And it's funny if you think about it, because the universe is so incredibly big and complicated. The, the stars are like 
100 to 1000 times the size of Earth. The distances between the galaxies and planets, it's so big, it's so incomprehensible, it's so complex and beautiful as well. A system that we are only a tiny insignificant part of. But people will look at the heavens, people will look at the planet and the sky and relate it back to themselves. They'll look at the planets, they'll see, well, today Mars and Jupiter are aligned. So that means your relationship is not going to go well and there's a chance you're going to be lovesick. Or, oh, the stars and the moon are aligned in a special way today and that means you're, you're going to have a lucky week this week. And they're really using these celestial bodies that are so big and so much more complex than most of these stupid people would ever be able to comprehend in any scientific or coherent way and taking something so much bigger than themselves and completely relating it back to their own egos. People still see the heaven full of stars and think that the meaning of these stars are more or less the petty things that go on in our day-to-day -day lives. Like the meaning of the whole heavens, the meaning of the universe relates back to, um, to, uh, to Karen breaking up with me. Yeah, I mean, that's why the stars align, right? So you and your girlfriend can break up. Stupid, 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 stupid. And that's how we humans tend to think, unfortunately. And I think religion is kind of the same. Sorry, religious people. You are welcome on my channel if you are a Muslim, if you're a Christian, if you're a Buddhist. I don't care. I respect your religion. I respect your point of view, but I also have my opinion. And if you can respect my opinion, I can respect yours. But in my opinion, a common theme in religion is most religions will look at the universe and say, God created it for us. God created the earth for you to enjoy. God created life as a test for humanity. God created plants and animals for humans to dominate and eat. God created gemstones and gold. God created the stars so you can enjoy their beauty. I'm sorry, but that's arrogant. Not everything revolves around our species. Not everything revolves around humans. Not everything is created with a specific purpose in mind to cater to you. If humans go extinct, the universe will continue to exist without you and without me. When we die, life goes on without us. And to say everything has a purpose? No, stop it. Not everything has a purpose. It's a toxic way of thinking. Open your mind, look at everything, and just respect the, the fact it is so big, so complex, and that we are just a tiny part of it that get to experience this beauty. Wow. I kind of went on a rant there, didn't I? I don't care. You paid me, so you can ask the question. The next question is by Karelina, and she asked me, Bart, you're so handsome. How much for a picture of your pee pee? <coughs> you paid me three dollars to ask me this question. What do I look like? A prostitute? Jeez. Eight hundred dollars and I'll do it. Pay me eight hundred dollars and I will show you the picture. See, you made one, one mistake here. You probably thought you were going to troll me with this question or something or get a rise out of me, but I'm really quite shameless, you know. But I have to think of my reputation, man. I can't just... Um, it's going to damage my reputation, so I have to make it really expensive. Yeah, sorry. I know it's probably just a silly question. Uh, thanks for tipping me, I guess. YouTube is crazy sometimes. And with that, we raised the $55 gold, people. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with Bart. 
If my Ko-Fi ever reaches another $55, I'm going to be back with another Dutch snack. By the way, in two months, there's going to be festivities in the Netherlands, there's going to be Christmas, there's going to be Sinterklaas. If you're interested in seeing special Dutch snacks, this is the time of the year. Because uh, from next month and beyond, temporary festive snacks are going to be available, you know? Just like how in America during Thanksgiving people eat turkey and stuff. In the Netherlands we also have days in which we eat special snacks related to certain holidays. I'm not going to spoil anything. And it also depends, you know, because it's the people like you who make it happen. It's not up to me. But um, if we can get another episode happening before December, I can show you some really interesting uh, treats for my country. Love you guys. See ya. We'll be back soon. Bye bye.